So let's just review a few of the things I told you here, some important things on this slide that says enhancing flavor. If you haven't read any of my books, I'm recommending that you read my latest book, Eat for Life. It has about 100 recipes in it that are good. Now, once you have those 100, and there's about 1,900 recipes on the website, by the way. 1,900, rated by members. But I'm presenting to you today the collection of recipes that I've very often used in my daily menus and my own personal life the most that I feel are important recipes you should know and learn how to make. Because sometimes reading it for the recipe to make from a book, you lose a lot of those nuances of how to make the soups and some of the little benefits of the currants versus the raisins. And it's better to talk about it once. But now you have enough information where if you want more recipes, you can go and access them either on the website. And I'm recommending that probably the first book, Eat for Life, and then the next book, if you want, that you would probably want to get to pursue further recipes would be the Eat to Live cookbook. Because I have like 10 recipe books. I have the Eat to Live Fair Cook and Easy book. I have the recipes for diabetes reversal, recipes for type. I have all these different recipe books and menu plans. But I'm suggesting the basic, the basic place to start for a new person starting would just to be to get Eat for Life and the Eat to Live cookbook would give you the most collection of recipes to open on your ta table in your kitchen to start with. Because, you know, that'll give you like my, my, the ones that I, I, I find most, my most favorites. Plus what we're going today, most of the recipes that we're going through today are somewhere on the, re on the website or in the, one of those books already. I'm just reviewing it with you for clarity and so you get the feel for the recipes I pick out that I use the most regularly. And then enhancing flavor, we discussed roasting garlic, using tomato paste, right? Dried tomatoes, always keeping sun-dried tomatoes in your house. You're going to go home and you're going to make sure you remove from your cupboard unhealthy foods and get a big construction garbage bag and dump the junk out of your house. Don't have it there to tempt you. There shouldn't be anything. And you're going to now make shelves, room in your shelves for beans and, and dried vegetables like dried mushrooms and maybe some unsweetened dried coconut flakes and sun-dried tomatoes and some dried nectarines or golden berries or huckleberries. You're going to have things that we're going to use in various recipes to flavor things that are healthy. You know, you're going to make sure you get some organic cur black currants to use as flavorings to mix in vegetable dishes. And we're going to roast peppers in the oven. We're going to baste portobello mushrooms or mushroom thin sliced mushroom caps. Baste them with balsamic vinegar and roast them in the oven too. But we're, if the roasted peppers darken or black and you're going to take that skin and throw it away, we're going to use some dried onion and dried mushroom to flavor things, to sprinkle on things. You're going to use fresh dill, fresh basil, fresh parsley, and fresh herbs, oregano and sage and rosemary. You're going to get fresh herbs and dried herbs. You're going to use a wok, and we're not going to put oil in the wok. We're going to put water in the base of the wok, but most of the time you don't need water because you put the tomato, you put the mushrooms in there, you start to wok, and it produces its own water, and then you add the onion and the other green vegetables on top, and you can wok things, and sometimes we'll mix some things like, like, to, like pineapple and tomato to make a Hawaiian wok, you know, or to give some, put some fruits or vegetables in the wok together. And the cinnamon we'll use on a, a lot, using the, the Ceylon cinnamon, not the cassia cinnamon. The Ceylon, C-E-Y-L-O-N cinnamon is healthier. You could use it more liberally. The cassia cinnamon has a little bit of a mild toxin in it. We're using those gourmet flavored vinegars, and I carry a line of gourmet flavored vinegars on the website so people can help to make this diet taste really gourmet. And the vinegar I probably use the most in my own personal um, cooking and the things I like to eat is probably the black fig vinegar I use the most in, most in my salad dressing thing. And I use a dark vinegar, like a black fig vinegar, when I'm using tomato sauces. And red sauces, I'm using a dark vinegar, like a balsamic or a black fig. But I'm using a fruity dressing or sauce, like a mango dressing or sauce, or a raspberry dressing or sauce, or an orange dressing or sauce, or an orange lemon flavoring, but I'm not going to use a dark vinegar that. Then you want to use a light vinegar, like an apple vinegar, or a pear vinegar, or, or a raisin or a raisling vinegar, or something like that. And then again, to reiterate, 
nutritional yeast could be used for like occasional use air pop popcorn. You could just spray the air pop popcorn with a little bit of water and you can, this, the nutritional yeast sti um, sticks to it. But of course the nutritional yeast is a flavoring. We're using it in a shaker and we're making sure you have non-fortified nutritional yeast. If they're fortifying it with vitamins, then they're using synthetic vitamins, cancer promoting and especially folic acid. I'm saying the most dangerous supplemental ingredients are vitamin A, acetone, and retinol palmitate, don't take anything with vitamin A in it, or beta carotene, folic acid, vitamin E is not good to take as a supplement. There's eight different vitamin E fragments. You take just one, it, it interferes with absorption of others and it has negative effects. And folic acid, of course. Folic acid, vitamin A, beta carotene, vitamin E. Those, you don't want to take those supplemental ingredients. The supplemental ingredients you do want to take, like iodine and zinc and vitamin D and DHA and B12, we'll talk about tomorrow morning, okay? Let's go on, because I'm using this Thai curry sauce, because I use a Thai sauce a lot. And I make it ver a very unique way, because I use the secret ingredient as a lemongrass. And most people use lemongrass paste or lemongrass seasoning, and there's not good ingredients in those things. I use real lemon, the bulb of lemongrass that I soak overnight in water or in coconut milk. I soak it overnight to soften it. And then I take the wooden lemongrass twig or sprout, and I cut the bottom woody part off, and I slit the side, which enables me to take the outermost woody section off the lemongrass, using the center of the lemongrass now that's been soaked and is softer and more blendable and pliable. So I have this soaked lemongrass that I've soaked overnight, and now I boil it for five minutes in a little bit of water just to cover the lemongrass, because I'm going to use the boiling water here that I boil the lemongrass in and put it in the blender with the lemongrass now. Remember, I soaked it overnight, then I boiled it in fresh water. Or you, in this case, you could remove the boil, you can cut it overnight, you can destem it, remove the woody part, and you can use the water that you soaked it in to boil it for five minutes. Then drop the boiling water and the lemongrass that's been softened and remove the woody part and put it in the Vitamix blender and blend it with some coconut and water. Coconut and water is coconut milk. And it's just coconut flakes and water or coconut and water. It's not coconut oil or coconut fat. It's just the cold coconut with water it mixed in with a little with a lemongrass. And now I will usually add a little hemp seeds in because I add hemp seeds to everything to balance out the omega-6 fatty acids and the pro-inflammatory um, effects of the coconut fats that are somewhat saturated in omega-6. I put a little hemp seeds in. So it's not all coconut. And then I'll put a, a little date in there for sweetening. Oh, I did put on the bottom hemp seed and peanut butter, and a little bit of peanut butter sometimes to add a little, to add a different flavor to it, a little flavor, more flavor to it. So it has the coconut, the peanut, and now I'll put the curry powder, a little turmeric in to give it a little more exotic flavor, but not so much to overpower the lemongrass flavor coming through, because that's what gives it the best flavor for Thai sauces. And I love to make the sauce. And we also do sell a Thai sauce that's already made for you on the website, where you can make your own in 10 minutes and dump it on, or you could take a spoonful of mine that's pre-made and dump it on. And what's really nice is that you walk some vegetables in a wok for 10 minutes. You don't put the sauce in the wok. You're just walking it in the vegetable juices until they're done, moving it around a little bit, covering it, taking it off, moving it around, whatever you wanted to use in there, the, right? The Savoy cabbage, the crinkly cabbage, the shredded bok choy, the shredded mushrooms, the onions, the snow pea pods, whatever you put in there, you wok it. Then you, you shut the flame off when it looks like it's, or broccoli florets, right? Chopped broccoli florets are good in there too. And then you shut the flame off while it's still hot, but not flaming or cooking, you take the sauce you made or you purchased and you just plop on a couple of tablespoons on that, depending on how much is there, and you mix it around and it's ready to be served. It takes you, you know, 10, 15 minutes to make a, a really nice dinner. And then chili, a good way to use soybeans. And when we make the chili, the unique thing to do is you take the extra firm tofu, not the firm tofu, the extra firm, and you freeze it first. Because now when you take it out of the freezer, you crumble it with your hands. And the frozen tofu that you allowed to defrost, and then you were crumbling it with your hands, makes it coalesce into like little hard, chewy balls, like little choice of chopped meat. And it adds a little chewy texture to the, ch to the chili. And you mix that 
with some dried soybeans that were soaked and cooked, or some canned beans. Usually, you can buy canned, you know, red beans or canned white beans or cannoli beans or canned soybeans that you then take canned beans or beans that you cooked, either one, and mix them in with the, of course, chopped onion and pepper, a little bit of minced garlic, raw, to give it that chili, you know, spice to it, chopped tomatoes and a little bit of chili powder, cinnamon, of course, add cinnamon to everything. We make things spicy with a little chili powder. It's always good to add cinnamon with it. Here you have, in this case, they have kidney beans and pinto beans. Of course, there again, I have a little bit of black currants because the black currants, a little bit of sweetness, goes really great with the tomato and the spice in there. And then, of course, dried tomatoes that were soaked and chopped up and sprinkled throughout the chili and mixed in there with the tomato paste. And, of course, a couple of tablespoons of garlic nutter. And this tastes really good, really terrific chili. And, of course, this is going to keep for probably a couple of weeks in your refrigerator because it's so rich in, these, in the tomato acids and things. One of my favorite foods in the world are artichokes. And even though I'll travel with a bag of frozen artichokes, I'll get frozen artichokes in Whole Foods Market. Of course, you take the frozen bag and I put it in my backpack and it gets all the backpack, you know, sopping wet because that's the frost that creates moisture. So what I do is I'll take the if I'm traveling with frozen fruit that's becoming defrosted as I'm traveling, I'll wrap it in like a dish towel or some, at least some paper napkins and then put it in a plastic bag with a tie on it so it doesn't get my backpack wet. But I'll usually stop on my traveling from city to city, buy the frozen vegetables, frozen broccoli florets, frozen peas, frozen artichoke hearts, and I'll just buy them frozen and let them sit in my room, in my hotel room, and let them defrost on top of the um, shelf of the motel room overnight or th through the day until they're defrosted, usually is overnight, and then it, when they're defrosted, I'll put them in the refrigerator, and I'll be eating them the next day or two or traveling with them. Once they're defrosted, they're not going to, you know, the defrosting process creates a lot of moisture. Once they're defrosted, they're, they're, they're not going to make my carry-on all wet, but I'll still put them in an extra bag. But, but my fa really favorite thing is to have artichokes fresh cooked. I love those. They're really low in calories, and they're very, very high in protein. Probably the lowest calorie and highest protein, which is a great food, and they're so for, for people who are looking to lose weight or are diabetic, you know, probably another 40% protein food. They're only 25 calories. It's crazily low in calories. So here's what you do. You take the artichoke, right? The whole artichoke, and I cut the top half inch off with the thorn, to remove the thorns. So when you handle them, you don't get stuck. Now I take a a heavy knife, a big, a big sharp knife, and I take this, and I hold the artichoke in my hand and position the knife so it hits the top of the stem so I can get the middle of the stem cutting through with a knife, pushing it down, down on, a, on a cutting board now, and because it's cutting right through the center of the stem, moving now down to the center of the artichoke, cutting through the artichoke, flipping it open into two even halves. We cut through the stem first, because if you cut through the top first, you may not hit the stem dead on and center it well. So now I have the stem and the heart cut nicely in half, and my two artichokes opened up so it will cook now in 18 minutes of steaming, as opposed to a whole artichoke not cut in half. It can take 45 minutes of cooking it, and this way the inside gets cooked at the same rate the outside's being cooked. So it's much better to cut it in half. Now that it's cut in half, I take a small pointed knife and I cut in deep along the demarcation line between the heart and the choke, where all that little peach fuzzy stuff is, like the peach fuzz, and the little purple plastic like um, leaves, small leaves in there. So I cut a deep cut in the shape of a banana or a half moon, remove, so right along the top of that fuzz, so I can pull out the choke and throw it away. So before I've steamed it, I removed the choke from the artichoke. So there's no choke inside, there's no fuzz, there's no of those little purple plastic leaves. And now I may have take my small knife, I may trim the stem to remove a little black or un, un leaves that, don't, aren't, that are not well formed to keep the stem looking even and nice. And I'll cut maybe an eighth of an inch off the end of the stem where it's, where it's been cut from the plant so it's nice green and not dark and blackened. So now I have my artichoke ready to steam. I'll steam it for eight, usually 18 minutes. The water's boiling before I put the choke in there. And I'll usually cook as many as I can fit in the pot. I might put eight halves or 10 halves because whatever I don't eat that night for dinner, I'll probably eat two or three of them for dinner, two or three cho um, artichoke halves for dinner. And whatever I don't want to eat, I'll put in the refrigerator and I'll take them for lunch or eat the next day or the day after that. They're just great to have in your refrigerator already cooked to eat cold. 
and they're cooked long enough so the outer petal can be pulled away from the center part and come out. If you're cooking it, before you shut the flame off and stop and take it out of the water and take the water out, pick up the choke cold with the tongs, grab on to hold the choke down with, a, with your wooden spoon, grab onto the outer leaf with a tongue and see if you can pull it out of the choke and see if it'll separate. If it won't separate, it probably needs to cook another couple of minutes. And then I personally find these to be so delicious with nothing on them. I don't even like to dip them in anything. I just like to eat and, and savor the flavor of artichokes with nothing on them. That's how much I love artichokes. But you can put them in one of the dips or sauces if you like. And then we make a lot of green chips. I don't call it kale chips because anything I have growing in the vegetable garden, including pea leaves and kale, you know, broccoli leaves and kohlrabi leaves and small cabbage leaves or any kind of green leaf that's edible, I'm going to take the green leaf and mix it with red onion and then make a sauce out of an apple cider or apple vinegar with some cashews and hemp seeds. You don't have to soak it, but we mix it with cashews and hemp. You don't need almond milk in there because of this cashews and hemp makes the milk with just water and a little bit of unfortified nutritional yeast to make the sauce in the blender a creamy, smooth sauce. And then you're going to toss that with your hands in with the green leaves and the onions so it's really well mixed. Then you lay it out on the pans in the dehydrator and you dehydrate it in the dehydrator at 120 degrees for 8 to 10 hours. Now here's the thing. When you buy kale chips in a store, they're mostly getting flavoring with a little bit of kale, and they're really too overly flavored, and you're not getting much kale there anyway. We also have kale chips that we sell that are mostly kale with a light sauce on them, but it's best when you make it yourself, too, or it's better when you're making your own because you don't have to make them as dehydrated. When we make a commercial version, and I'm selling mine off the website, they're going to be kale chips that are real dry like a chip because you have to have shelf life. We can't leave moisture in the chip. It's not because it could go bad. The dried was makes it, you know, keeps it fresh. But when you make your own, you could make them so they're partially dehydrated and still retain a little more moisture in them. So they're not quite, so they're more nutritious. And they also have a different type of flavor. They're not quite as dried out and crunchy, but they're still really have a good crunch and a good little combination of softness and crunchiness at the same time. You follow me? So this, the dehydrator is not an expensive piece of equipment, but it's such a nice piece of equipment because it enables us to make things that are crunchy without burning them or darkening them. So we could have that mouthfeel of something hard or crunchy that we're missing and that people are getting when they make things like pretzels and chips and stuff like that. You follow me? Yeah, you don't need almond milk. You can put almond milk or some plant milk in there, but you don't need it because the cashews and the hemp seeds blended with water makes the sauce sufficient. You can put soy milk in it if you want, too. I usually would probably put a little soy milk or put water in, cashews and hemp seeds, nutritional yeast, apple cider vinegar, toss it around and do it for 8 to 10 hours. If I was going to make it into a real chip chip, it would be like 13 to hours. And I'll make pizza. I'll make to tofu pizza. Like I'll make it, it's like beef jerky. It's like tofu jerky, hard, like hard. So it's hard, so you can't just like eat it. You got to like keep it in your mouth and chew on it for a while. I'll take like extra firm tofu and I'll take that block of tofu and I'll cut it into like five pancake-like um, slices and lay the pancake-like slices on the food process, on the dehydrator so the smooth squares now are abutting each other with no space in between them. And then I'll take my tomato sauce, either my homemade tomato sauce that's thick or I'll take a commercial tomato sauce that I thickened. I thickened it by cooking it a little bit or by adding the sun-dried tomatoes to it and now I'll cover the top of the, make a thick coating of tomato sauce on top of the slices of the tofu laying in the dehydrator. And now I'll dehydrate that for like 15 hours at 120 degrees. And I'll take them out of the dehydrator and they'll have separated in the dehydration process. And I'll slice them into strips. And my dog loves them. I feed them to the dog like little tofu bones. But they're great for travel. And they're great, a uh, little addition to a meal to have like a chewy tofu jerky or something to eat along with your soup or your salad or something. So reviewing here, these preferred cooking method, we're walking, we're steaming, we're blanching, we're roasting in the oven at low temperatures when we're using things like roasting peppers and roasting marshmallows, quick boiling just for quick blanching, 
right? Or in soup cooking, which we're basically cooking on a low flame, and tomato sauce cooking, where we're cooking a low flame for long periods of time, and we're using the dehydrator. The steamed vegetables, you're trying to, you know, watch your steamed vegetables and test them out, usually between 8 to 12 minutes. But leafy things, like asparagus there, 8 minutes. Broccoli might be longer, like 12 or 13 minutes, depending on where you live and the altitude and where, you know. That means once the water gets, the water starts boiling, make sure you time it. Don't go over 12 minutes. But in many cases, I'm steaming less these days because we're finding that blanching is just so much easier sometimes. You don't have to use a timer. You can stand over it for one minute and just get it done. And it's really, if you have the right big pot, if you have a big boiling pot of water, it's so easy just to blanch it and pull it right out and it's done. And I mentioned this recipe yesterday, the cauliflower mashed potatoes, which we like which is really, you can make it all cauliflower like here, and here's cauliflower florets, eight cups. You can use fresh spinach or frozen spinach chopped up and mixed in with it. I use the garlic nutter, which is just roasted garlic with nuts mixed in to make it creamy. A little veggie zest for flavoring, nutmeg and turmeric, little plant milk to thin as desired, and I'm probably gonna choose to add a little touch of white potato, even though I'm not recommending white potato as a major source of your calories, you can use it in small amounts, as, you know, in small amounts, and we're using it just one potato, one cup of potato with eight cups of cauliflower is reasonable, and it tastes really like a fantastic mashed potato. California cream kale, my kids were raised on this thing, they loved it, of course. I used to tell my son, who's now 20 years old, but I used to tell him when he was three or four years old, I used to say to him, Get, don't eat that kale. That's for me. I need it for my strength and my power. Can't have you eating all the kale. Then I won't, then I won't be strong enough and you'll be too strong. He'd eat the kale and, and come running over to me and give me a push. And I'd like stumble backwards and hit the couch and do a backflip over the couch, fall down back over the couch and say, get that kale away from the kid. It's getting too strong. God, get it away. Don't let him eat so much kale. He'd come down the stairs in the morning going, give me the vegetables. I gotta get dad. You know, I can't. But this is really easy to cook. You take the kale or the collards, and you, I like to mix a few different types, maybe kale and collards together, which are mild tasting, which my kids love. They love the mild tasting greens. And I put it in a steamer and pull it, let it steam for eight minutes or so, and then take it out of the steamer, and I would take a, a dish towel in a wooden chopping bowl, and I would flip the steamer over again and drop the steam kale into the wooden chopping bowl with a dish towel in it. I'd fold the dish towel on top of the kale or collards and flip it upside down and press it down to get the water out of it, to get the moisture out. Because when I add the sauce to the greens, you don't want the water it moist because it'll suck, it'll dilute the sauce and not have it be flavorful. So I push the water out of the kale, and now I remove the dish towel, and I could use my chopper, but I've been preparing my sauce in the blender with the cashews and the hemp seeds, a little soy milk and onion flakes, and nutritional yeast. I'll make the, almost the same sauce I made for the dried kale chips. And I take the sauce, and my son was young, he just liked plain cashews and hemp seeds and soy milk. No, we don't want onion flakes and nutritional yeast, he just liked it plain. So we take the, the sauce, and I would add the soy milk there, blending the blender and just adding a little more as I need to get just the right thickness I like, to look like not too thin, but not, not thick like peanut butter, but thin enough so it would spread. And I'd take that sauce, put it into the chopped greens and chop it with the, with the chopper, with the, you know, the chopping blade with by hand in the, in the wooden chopping bowl, and then to mix the sauce in with the crane kale. And now I have the kale sitting on a plate or in a bowl. And now I would drizzle some tomato sauce on top and maybe a splash of chopped red onion or chopped scallion on top of that tomato sauce raw. So I have these mixture of flavors and it really is a fantastic dish, so simple. And of course, my kids were raised on this thing. They ate this more than anything else. And then we make burgers, right? You want to have at least good one burger recipe you like, and the burgers usually mix together beans and walnuts and mushrooms and a grain like some oats, and it's some, or tempeh or tofu. You know, so it's usually making us some kind of a burger that you cook in the oven on a low flame, and then after it cooks for 20 minutes or so on a low flame, you take a spatula and you take it out and you flip it over and you let it cook for another 15 minutes on the other side so both sides get kind of a little bit crispy. And one of the burgers that a lot of people like on the website is called the Better Burger, which just has a lot of these ingredients all mixed into one burger, right? Because here we have the oats and the tofu, 
that we've frozen and then extra firm tofu that you first froze, then you let it defrost, then you crumble it. It gives a chewy mouthfeel like a, like a burger with, a, with red beans, walnuts, tomato paste, tomatoes, my tomato zest seasoning, the garlic nutter or roasted garlic in there, a little nut and garlic in there, holds it together. Finely minced up mushrooms and then the seasonings like basil, oregano, rosemary and thyme, onion, diced onion or dried onion flakes. And if you want, you could use chopped spinach, but too much chopped spinach makes the burger fall apart. So you can't put too much spinach in or the burger doesn't hold together. And then, and then lastly, we're going into desserts like ice cream and sorbets. Of course, my most go-to dessert, which I make the most, is just three ingredients, frozen bananas. I'll take four frozen bananas, which serves about six people. Four frozen, could serve, could serve eight people with a smaller portion, six people with a full portion, with a bigger portion. Half a cup of ch uh, freshly ch um, cracked macadamia nuts. I don't know about you guys, but if you get macadamia nuts in the shell, like Hawaiian macadamia is in the shell, and you crack them yourself, they're like incredibly flavored, like nothing you've ever tasted before, like sweet and flavorful, and they make the greatest ice cream in the world. All you do is put the macadamia nuts in with the frozen bananas that you freshly cracked, and then you put in the real secret ingredient, the real vanilla bean powder, a teaspoon of real vanilla bean powder in that, you know, heaping teaspoon of vanilla bean powder in that with the four banana, frozen bananas. And, and wow, that makes the greatest ice cream. Three ingredients. I might be blending it, and I might just put a little plant milk in just to help it blend in the Vitamix better or to blend with the S-Blade and the food processor better. You know, put a little bit of just enough soy milk so it thickens and blends smoothie. Now, I can make the same ice cream with walnuts, but every time I'm serving this ice cream, and I'm serving it to people who have never who are saying, well, how is your ice cream to taste compared to a conventional ice cream? It's not going to be as sweet, but it tastes better than conventional ice cream. When eating a conventional ice cream, it's just so overly sweet. It's sickeningly sweet because it's made to appeal to people's bliss points, which means it's a bliss point, means they're going into an addictive level of sugar to make people want to think about having it again and developing a craving for it. You're trying to hit their brain centers with a bliss point. So when you buy commercials desserts, they're super sweet. When you eat a dessert, now remember, I didn't, add, I didn't even add a date to this. I just added the vanilla bean powder, which is not sweet, and the nuts are, are only a little bit sweet, and the banana, it's plenty sweet just with the banana. If I wanted to make a chocolate ice cream and I added cocoa nibs or cocoa powder or unsweetened cocoa um, powder to it, then it would make it a little more bitter. And then I would add one medjool date per serving, per person. So I'd add about four or five medjool dates to it if I made it to make it chocolatey, to make it taste really good. So ice creams are great. And one of my favorite ice creams, this is called the vanilla or chocolate and ice cream. We just went over that, right? With the bananas and the walnuts there. And I'm saying, you know, you can use macadamia nuts and really fresh cracked macadamia nuts and want to make it super special. And then I use these sorbets like the strawberry pineapple sorbet and the mango coconut and ice cream. The difference between a sorbet and an ice cream is the... The sorbet doesn't have nuts in it. The ice creams have nuts or coconut in it because it makes it, gives it that, that smoothness, the creamy mouthfeel. So, if you, so you can put it back in the freezer again and it won't come out like a rock. It'll still come out like you can scoop it out with a spoon or with an ice cream scoop. So in here, we're making an ice cream, not a sorbet. I'm taking frozen mango, a bag of frozen mango, which has the greatest mangoes when you buy frozen mangoes. They're more evenly sweet. So you take the frozen mango, a squeeze of lemon, and a little bit of unsweetened coconut flakes, shredded coconut, and you could mix it in there with a little bit of uh, milk, and it's just a little, the greatest thing, just coconut, shredded coconut, unsweetened shredded coconut, a little squeeze of lemon with frozen mango. You don't need to sweeten it with the dried mango as mentioned here in the recipe. It's sweet enough with just the mango and the coconut with the squeeze of lemon is sweet enough. If you're making it more for a conventional taste, then people want it extra sweet like a birthday party or something. You can put a little dried mango and let it soak in the, in the soy milk overnight and give them and soften the dried mango and mix it with the frozen mango to sweeten it more. But you don't need that. It tastes fantastic not being overly sweet. And like the strawberry pineapple sorbet, when I do taste tests with children and we see what they like the best, they don't like it overly sweetened. Especially, you know, it's funny that you develop this food addiction to think that everything has to be so sweet. But if you take quid, kids who aren't yet as addicted to the sweets, they like the desserts better with less sweet in it.
Like they like the strawberry pineapple sorbet with that little squeeze of lemon. Here it has the frozen strawberries, which are, which are strawberry flavored, but not that sweet. With a little bit of orange we put in there, a little bit of navel orange usually. I don't need orange juice in there. Squeeze of lemon, navel orange, and a couple of, one slice of unsweetened dried pineapple in there with one or two bags of frozen strawberries. Whipped up makes the greatest strawberry pineapple sor sorbet, and kids love this, and they love the combination of pineapple, lemon, and strawberry flavor. And then my kids always loved the apples, the stewed apples with flax seeds and walnuts and cinnamon. You can put nutmeg in there too if you want, but they always love to have it. And in this case, I use currants instead of raisins most often. So I'll take a pot really quickly if I want to make it fast and I'll put a little currants or raisins in the bottom of the pot. I'll cover that with water, just enough water to cover the raisin or the currants. When I put it on a really low flame, it'll help stew the raisin and the currant and soften it. And as it's softening and steaming, I'll put the chopped apple on top of the raisin or currant. Don't mix it in yet. Just let it sit on top. Close it off on the top. Let that stew for three or four minutes. While, and let's bubble on a low flame for three to five minutes while you're ch making some chopped walnuts, ground flax seeds, and cinnamon mixed together. Now you're gonna take that, put it in your chopping bowl, chop it with the walnuts and the flax seeds and the cinnamon, and a little bit of currants were in there. Now that we're softened, then you mix this base apple surprise. You don't have to put it on a crust. You just then may wanna put a little dollop of ice cream on that and have an apple, like a stewed apple, a little vanilla ice cream combination that kids really love. And then at a retreat, we make these things like these very non-sweetened, like what are they called? Um, I call them a cello, which are like cello, jello. We make a creamy one with a little bit of soy milk and tofu in it that's hardly sweet. It just has a little bit of tofu and soy milk and a vanilla flavoring with hardly any sweetener. It tastes so good as a dessert. Maybe a little bit of date in there. And the secret ingredient, of course, is the agar powder or agar flakes that make it coalesce into a jello-like consistency. So you take either agar flakes, whatever cup of whatever you're using, cup of blueberries, soy milk and tofu, strawberries, or we're using mango, whatever you want to make this jello, or frozen cherries. You're taking a half a teaspoon of this agar, and you're dissolving in a little bit of hot water that you made, you brought water to boiling, you shut the water off, so it's just getting hot now. You dissolve the agar into it, you mix it into the, with the fruit, and you put it in the refrigerator. You could mix the date in there. You could put the vanilla in there. Oh, panna cotta, that was the, what I was talking about. Just the milk, just the soy milk and the vanilla, and a date, a little bit of the soft soy or the, the um, silken tofu was really delicious. You make a panna cotta out of it, which is dates, milk, the soy milk, and the vanilla with hardly any, and you don't make it very sweet, just so it has a very touch of sweetener in there. Or you take the berries and you cook them down a little bit in a pot, on a low flame just to thicken it a little bit with a splash of vinegar and you make either a berry jam to make into a, to mix in with the, whatever it is you're mixing in there, right? To put on top of the panna cotta to make the berry jam or to make a raspberry or berry jam to drizzle on top of your, let's say, vegetable, on your asparagus maybe. You, may, you, don't, you don't cook it as much so it's more thin like a syrup and you make a, a berry syrup to put on top of your asparagus slices or something. So we make a lot of delicious desserts. And fudgy black bean brownies are really just almond butter with black beans with cocoa powder and a few dates. The secret ingredient is the ground chia seeds because the ground chia seeds absorb water and make it and fill out the cake even so it's not as dense as a, as a, as a bean cake. It makes it more fluffy, holds onto water, and this you only, we hardly even cook it. We put it in the oven just to make the crust, just to make the outside look like a brownie. We probably cook it at a low temperature for maybe 20 minutes. The inside is not even cooked, it's just raw. The beans are already cooked already. So using cooked beans or canned beans, we mix it with dates, almond butter, vanilla powder, cocoa powder, little soaked chia seeds, ground soaked chia seeds. And then if we want to make an avocado icing to it, we could mix avocado and cocoa powder and date and make an icing to it. And we have a great um, bean brownie that's low glycemic because beans are so low glycemic. And you can always take fruit and put it onto a pie crust. And we make the pie crust usually with, shred with rolled oats with either shredded pecans, shredded coconut, shredded almonds, or a mixture of pecans, almonds, and coconut mixed in with the rolled oats. And sometimes I'll get those coconut rolls with the 
their um, date rolls with the coconut on top, and we, you, they're already mushed up dates, and you could like mush them with your hands, and you can knead them, knead them with the oats and the nuts to, to spread it, to get it, so it's like not as much date and more nuts and oats in there, and you could spread it out in the bottom of the pan, and you don't have, and because it's not, it doesn't have to be cooked, so you can just heat it in the oven just enough to make it congeal together. You can just heat it in the oven for a very low temperature. We're talking about you know, 250 to 300 for a short period of time, you know, 15 to 20 minutes, just so it congeals and gets in, and flattens down like a pie for the fruits, like see, settle into the crust and you have a delicious, you know, some really um, interesting ways to make some quick desserts. And again, these fancy desserts we're probably having on the weekend once or twice a week. Most nights for dessert are just some delicious fruit, fresh fruit or frozen fruit.